Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is great to be in the house of the Lord. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Pastor Carl. And I am greatly privileged to have you here this morning. Otherwise, I guess I'd be talking to myself. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, again, I want to thank those who are joining us online and also those that are at Lopez. Uh, thank you for being here. And those that are in the house today, I tell you, thank you. Thank you. Give yourselves a hand. We are packed in here this morning. And like they said, if you can move over a little bit as you can look to the back, you can see people standing at the door looking for a seat. So if you can move over and give them opportunity, regardless Regardless to how you voted, it's time to pick up and move towards healing of our land. I say that because mainstream America is in need of repentance, in need of repentance. And we need a healing in our land because it seems like we have lost our way. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and restore their land. Amen. Now, most of us, we just stop right there, but I want to continue with verse number 15. It says, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every, word, every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy. And I believe our nation has been set apart to be holy. I believe the people of this congregation have been set apart in order to be holy to the Lord. And it says, and set it apart to be holy place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over them or watch over it for it is dear to my heart. God's temple is not a building, but God's temple is a people. And I want to ask a question this morning, but I'm not looking for a response. How many righteous do we have in this building? How many righteous do we have in America that God would cancel the judgment that he has coming towards this land? Because it's time for us to bend our hearts and pray and ask for forgiveness. And if you agree with me with this statement I just made, would you stand to your feet and pray with me? Repeat after me this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive us for sinning against you. Forgive us for staying silent in the midst of evil. Forgive us for not pushing your agenda forward. Forgive us for the anti-God profile of our country. Help our nation rediscover her roots. Help her press toward you in a glorious way. Help us be ready for your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. You may be seated. Now, President Trump may be headed to the White House, but I'm thankful that we have a Lord and Savior who's in the big house. Amen. And I want to let you know that no president is ever your Savior. We serve a Savior who went to the cross, and by the blood of Jesus, we are saved and we have eternal life. The presidents around the globe, the kings around the globe, they are only but a tool in the hands of an awesome God. But until they turn their face towards God and repent and see him as Lord and Savior, we will continue to go in circles. Let us turn in our Bibles to the book of Hosea. Now, I want to warn you this morning that this is an R-rated sermon this morning. So if you have children or youth that are sitting in the auditorium or listening, this would be a great opportunity for you to take, care, take advantage of the children's ministry or the youth ministry. 
Otherwise, all the way home, you're going to have to talk about what I talked about. You're going to have to re-preach this sermon. So you decide. You decide. The nation of Israel, they started out in a covenant relationship with our God, our Father. A covenant is a promise. Now, those of you who are in the auditorium or listening at home who are married, you will understand what a covenant relationship in marriage is all about. It's where you make a promise of your heart. And you say, my heart belongs to you, that one that you marry, that one that you have that gleam in your eye towards, and you say, my heart belongs to you. And Jesse and Michelle said, why are you looking at me? (laughs) They just got married. (laughs) Brand new newlyweds, amen? Still fresh, still fresh. But God made a covenant relationship with Israel. And he said, you will be my bride. And he took them to the promised land with an expectation that they would be obedient to the vows that they had made. Because God would be obedient to the vows that he had made to them. But as we look at this book of Hosea, we see that they reneged on their promise to God. But this book of Hosea is about the separation of God from his bride and then the calling him, them back into his position or into his arms. And why did he call them back? He called them back because he loved them, because he was in love with them. The same reason that he calls us back when we stray away from the relationship that we have with him, he calls us back because he loves us. Now, this sermon this morning might come off more as a speech or one of those things because a couple of days ago, I strained my voice. Have you ever been in a situation to where you kind of swallow wrong and then you cough and cough and cough? Well, that caused a strain in my throat. And so I'm going to try and put this off, but your prayers will help to make this happen or not. But... As we look at 1 Peter chapter 4, and it's not on the uh, back screen, I just pulled this up this yesterday. It says, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sin. In other words, if we have that agape love that flows from God in our lives, it doesn't matter what happens in our life that we're able to forgive others. It doesn't matter what happens as that person who is sitting next to you, your spouse. It doesn't matter what they have done to you. You have forgiveness for them if that agape love is flowing through you. And so this is what we see with God the Father. That love that flows through his heart and touched the life of Hosea and Gomer. Now, this is an interesting story also because God calls Hosea, a prophet, to marry a prostitute. And this relationship between Hosea and Gomer is a typical example of what God's relationship was like with Israel. And Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom, while Isaiah was a prophet to the southern kingdom. That was when the kingdom split. And then Hosea chapter 1 and verse number 2, it says, When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. In other words, the Israelites, what they had done, they had given themselves over to idolatry. They had exchanged the relationship that they had with God with the, ex- with the relationship they had with Baal. And they began to run after idols. And they cheated on their husband, God. God is a husband who never cheats. But he expects us also to be husbands that never cheat. If you can't say amen, say ouch. (laughs) Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 1. 
Did I slurp? <laughs> Excuse me. Hosea chapter 4, verse number 1, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. The Lord has brought charges against you, saying there is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in the land. Does it sound like a land that we know? There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. You make vows and break them. You kill and steal and commit adultery. There is violence everywhere, one murder after another. When you forget your vows or when you forget where you came from, you have a tendency to break those vows and sin. You open yourself up to adultery. You give away something that belongs to your spouse. You give away something that belongs to them, and you give it to another. And this is what Israel was doing. Something that belonged to God, their devotion, their heart, their mind, their body, every aspect of who they were, they were giving it away to Baal. You don't hear me this morning. The Israelites embraced another lover. And God is a jealous God, and being a jealous God, he will not share his love with anyone. The same thing as with in my life with my wife, I am not willing to share her with anyone except for God. And therefore, I am a jealous husband, not jealous in the sense that I want to control that relationship, but in the sense that I know the gift that God has given to me, and in knowing that gift that belongs to me, therefore, I cherish that gift. And therefore, I would not do anything that will spoil or go against that gift. Why? Because of the Spirit of God who is in me that has called me to be in relationship with her, but also to be in relationship with him. And therefore, I will not sin against her because I don't want to sin against my God. Israel has sinned against their God by giving their devotion and their heart and their love to another. Does this verse describe our nation? A nation who has given her love to someone else. We've heard over and over and over of how we continue to want to sacrifice our children, but we call it something else. Women's rights. The enemy is not dumb, and he continues to do the same thing over and over again, to pull us into an adulterous relationship and to make choices that God does not want us to make. Their marriage to God had become a lie. Am I talking to someone here this morning? Has your marriage become a lie? Because God is about restoration. This nation needs restoration. Because our marriage of this nation with God has become a lie. But God is in the business of restoration. Amen? Amen. Psalm 106 verse 35 This is what happened with Israel. Instead, they they mingled among the pagans and adopted their evil customs. They worshiped their idols, which led to their downfall. They even sacrificed their sons and daughters to the demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, by sacrificing them to the idols of Canaan. They polluted the land with murder. They defiled themselves by their evil deeds. And their love of idols was adultery in the sight of God, our Lord. When I was back in Detroit, we used to do street witnessing. And I remember uh, as we went street witnessing a particular young lady that I spoke to. And I asked her the question, how did you end up here? Because she was a street walker, a prostitute. And I said, how did you end up here? And she told me, she said, I used to be married. She said, but I opened the door to someone 
that I thought was a nice young man. I opened my heart and I adulterized my marriage. That led me to drinking, smoking weed, and then smoking crack. That's how I ended up here, she said. And I told her, we serve a God who's in the business of restoration. And even though you are an adulterer, there's forgiveness that flows from the throne room of heaven that can change your life right where you are. And God can restore anything that we have broken. Adultery is about self-destruction. And we saw that in her life. Look at Galatians with me. Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 7. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Whatever seed you put into the ground, there will be a harvest of that seed. And we know the story of sowing and reaping. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from the sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Unfaithfulness blinds us to the potential consequences. There is always a consequence to choosing sin. There is always a consequence to the adulterous life. But Jesus showed love and mercy to this land. Our Father showed love and mercy to the Israelites. Hosea showed love and mercy to Gomer. He married her, embraced her, but every now and then she would drop back into her, her, whole, her old lifestyle of prostitution. We have seen that around the globe with different countries. Jesus shows love and mercy even to those who commit adultery. And I was surprised when we heard about the Samaritan woman because that's one of my examples, thank you. <laughs> I said, I hope she doesn't preach my sermon. <laughs> but she made a left turn. Praise the Lord. Because the adulterous woman at the well, when Jesus came upon her, and he began to talk to her, and she said, shall I go and get my husband? Because I perceive that you are a prophet. And he said, go get your husband. In fact, you have five husbands, and the one that you're with now is not your own. Caught in adultery. And remember the woman who was caught in the adultery where the leaders brought her and threw her before Jesus and said, what shall we do with her? This is what the law says, that she should get stoned. Not with drugs. <laughs> but she should be pelted with rocks. And then they were trying to trap Jesus in that situation. And Jesus, as the word says, he began to what? Right in the sand. And one by one, her accusers walked away. And Jesus said, where are your accusers? They're gone. I do not accuse you. Go and sin no more. In other words, your sin of adultery is forgiven you, but go and sin no more. The stain on you is covered in the blood that is about to come, but go and sin no more. I forgive you of your sin. There is no sin under the earth that God is not able to feel, to forgive, even adultery. You may say in your mind, Pastor Carl, there's no help no, from God for me. There's no hope. 
there's always hope. As that song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's what it's all about. But sin has this way of hardening the heart, especially in adultery. Because in adultery, what happens is the person who is sinning in adultery, what they're trying to do is fulfill the flesh. Because the enemy has caused an idol to come before them, and that idol that has come before them is sex. And many times the doorway to adultery is pornography. So men and women who are stuck Serving that idol of pornography, you have opened a door to adultery. Well, that hasn't happened to me yet, Pastor Carl. Well, it's on the way because you're bending your knee towards that idol, and that idol is opening up the door. Just as the Israelites have begun to bend their knee towards the idols, and then it begins to open the doors, and they begin to worship the idols. You're on your way to worshiping the next idol, and that is going against the vows of your marriage. That relationship. Well, people, and I've counseled individuals, and they say some of the weirdest things. I'm having sex outside my marriage. I just want to be happy. Don't I deserve to be happy? How deluded. The enemy has convinced you to go against the vows of the person that God has given to you, that gift that God has given to you. The enemy has convinced you that you ought to be happy. Marriage is not about happiness. Marriage is not about happiness. And guess what? That human being sitting next to you that you're married to can never make you happy. And God made it that way for a reason. Because he is the only one who can bring joy into your life. He is the only one that can satisfy your soul, that can satisfy your spirit. Because you are married to him. The Israelites jumped in bed with the idols because they wanted to be happy. They wanted something given to them that they felt that the Father was not giving to them. And when you jump into adultery, you feel like you're able to get something that maybe you're not getting out of your relationship with your wife or your husband. Well, God never intended for you to be happy in that relationship. He called you into that relationship to show the world what a Christian marriage is all about. And it's not about your happiness. It's about a mandate that he has placed upon your family for the cause that he has for this globe. God has called you and your spouse into a relationship, a covenant relationship that he can show his glory through you. It's not about your happiness. Somebody needs a wake-up call this morning because you have bowed your head and your knee to an idol. The choices you make have a cause and an effect more than you can imagine. Well, it's permissible by law that I can get a divorce. Is it permissible by God? Because I'm not happy in this relationship. That's another sermon for another day. And then you know what? The enemy tries to get you to blame somebody else. Well, it's her fault that I'm not happy. Well, it's her fault that I'm doing pornography. Well, it's her fault that I'm doing this, that, or the other. No, it's your fault. Because you make the choice to go to that electronic phone or that electronic computer, or however you're receiving it into your eyes, into your heart, you make the choice. And God this morning want to cut off the choice. But you have to want to be back in a relationship that he has called you to. 
You made a vow before God saying, I do. And God was your witness. But way before that, when he brought that person into your life, it was for a purpose, his purpose. When he came into the relationship with the Israelites, it was not about their purpose. It was about his purpose. When this country started, it's not about our purpose. It's about his purpose. I want to help you understand that adultery is spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Whether you believe it or not. Idols get you to change your focus from God to self. Adultery is about selfishness. It's not about serving God. It's not about serving your spouse. It's about serving self. And the enemy gets you to change the focus to yourself. Well, I can walk under my own strength. I can make my own decisions. I can make my own choices. I can live for myself. The enemy has convinced some. But this morning, your heart needs to change. Unless your heart change, it will be one adulterous fair after another, after another. And it starts with looking. Well, Pastor Carl, have you seen... I'm going to speak from the men's perspective. Pastor Carl, <laughs> that's the only perspective I can speak from. <laughs> Unless you want me to call my wife up here and she preach alongside of me. Well, Pastor Carl, have you seen how these women dress around here? I'm not going to go there. Some of you are like, I'm not going there. I'm sticking with what God gave me. I could. Pastor Carl, have you seen how some of these women dress? I can't help but look. Well, the first look is because someone is walking by you. The second look. It's idolatry. Well, should I pluck my eyes out? I don't think that's necessary. But figuratively, something needs to be plucked in your heart. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. But until you get serious to say, because of his compassion, he has drawn me back to him. He has called me back to him. And there is something in my heart, in my spirit, that says I need to walk back to God. I need to give up this adulterous relationship. And I need to set my heart on the things of God. Lord, I am ready to serve you right now. And that call what? Repentance. The heart needs to change. But go with me to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7 and verse number 20. The heart needs to change. And some of you need to be wailing like that child. <laughs> because of the spirit and what he's doing in your heart right now. Verse number 20 says, and then he added, it is what comes from inside you. For from within, out of the person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, slot, pride, foolishness, all these vile things. Adultery is vile. All of these vile things come from within. They are what defiles you. They are what defiles you. It's time to come back to God. Repent. My conclusion comes early. And I know some of you say, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. You'll be up here in a moment. <laughs> repentance is necessary just as Gomer had to repent and go back to her husband Hosea 
Just as the Israelites had to repent and go back to their husband, God the Father, there are some that need to repent and go back into relationship with our Lord and Savior and be the bride of Christ that he has called us to be. Hosea chapter 14 and verse number 1. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for your sins have brought you down. Bring your confession and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all our sins and graciously receive us, so that we may offer you our praises. Assyria cannot save us, nor can our war horses. Never again will we say to the idols we have made, you are our God. No, you alone do the earth find mercy. There's no way around coming back to the groom except through humility and repentance. James chapter 4 and verse number 4. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And God has called us to a faithful relationship. Don't get, cru- get caught up in the crosshairs of what Satan desires for you. The moment you got married, he began to destroy that marriage. Because he knows that when two people get married, they establish a Christian home. He doesn't want to see that. So he will do everything that he can to destroy your marriage. It's almost like the thief that comes to steal. If you leave a window unlocked, and the thief comes around and shake every door, check every window, eventually he checks that window. And that's where he comes in. What window have you op- opened up or left unlocked? Because the Lord wants to close it and lock it today in order to protect what he has called you into, the vows that you have made to your spouse. 1 Peter, verse number 5, chapter 5, verse number 8. 1 Peter, chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. That young lady that you think is charming, that you're falling into an emotional relationship with, resist. That guy that you work with, that you think he has all the answers that my husband don't have. He has all the muscles that my husband don't have. The word of God says what? Resist them. Be a Joseph. Joseph did what? Ran. You got to run. You've got to run. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, and this is talking about persecution, but there's a message in this verse for you. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory... In Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And the way I'm using this is to say that God will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish your marriage on a solid foundation. Because he has called you into that relationship. And I believe that's what God wants to do this morning with those that are married. If you're married and you're in this auditorium and at home, I want you to stand to your feet 
at this moment. That's whether your spouse is here or not. Wow. I was going to call you to the front. (laughs) But it seems like we have a lot of married folks here. And so I'm going to ask if you'll come and play on the piano. God wants to reestablish who you are in that relationship. God wants to reestablish who you are in your marriage. God wants to reconfirm you in your marriage. And it doesn't matter about what that person has done to you. But what matters is what he wants to do through you. God can restore any relationship if you give it to him. And that's what I want us to do this morning. Give our marriage and our relationship back to God. And I know I didn't give you guys a title of this message. Because I wanted to wait until now to tell you what it is. Loving the adulteress. Because I believe that all who are standing is guilty one way or another. Are you calling all of us adulterers in one way or another? Because at one time we may have looked at another or even thought for a moment I would have been better off with this other person. Those are seeds that the enemy places in our hearts. And God says this morning, recommit. Recommit to me. Because we have a generation before us who need to see what godly marriage is all about. We stand before a world who is anti-God. We love God. And we need to love our marriage. Because that is our first level of ministry. If you don't get it right in marriage, how can you get it right to someone who's watching? Let us pray. Father God, we stand before you this morning asking for your forgiveness. However slight or however heavy our actions have been, toward sabotaging our marriage. We ask for your forgiveness. And God, in your forgiveness, we know that we will have life and have it more abundantly because you are an awesome God. Lord, you're cleaning up your church. And we hear over and over again how whole churches are coming to repentance because of the move of the Spirit and what you're wanting to accomplish in these last days. Lord, help us to be sober-minded in our marriages. Help us to be sober-minded in the relationships that we have with the opposite sex. Help us to be sober-minded in our vows to you as your bride. Lord, forgive us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah, hallelujah. With all eyes closed, all heads bowed, you're sitting here this morning, and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're not a part of the bride of Christ. You're not even guilty of adultery because he's never become your groom. And I want to give you an opportunity right now to ask him to be your groom. That you want a life 
with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, or you want to recommit to that marriage, if that is you and you would say, Pastor Carl, pray for me. I need what you just described. Pray for me. All across this auditorium, all, all eyes are closed, all heads are bowed. I need to be a part of the bride of Christ. Thank you for your prayers. Right there where you are, just raise your hand and say, pray for me. Leave it there for a moment. Thank you, thank you. Leave it there for a moment. Leave it there for a moment. Let me see who I'm praying with. Hallelujah, hallelujah. This is why you're here this morning to get it right with God. Because when he calls his bride home, you will be caught up to meet him in the air. Hallelujah. You may put your hands down. Lord, thank you for those hands that went across this auditorium and those that were at home. And Lord, now we stand before you and ask for your forgiveness. And I'm going to ask everyone in this congregation and at home to pray along with me so that these that have raised their hand will not pray alone. Let us all pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your salvation that you continue to offer. And I ask you for your forgiveness for all of my sins. And I ask you to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you that you come into my heart. And I thank you for your forgiveness. And from this day forward, I will serve you. I will be a part of the bride of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.